we are going to continue with as um, Pastor Telezi has alluded that we are still on the subject of praise and worship. Yes, indeed, we have taken a very long break on this subject. But we trust the Lord Holy Spirit that he's going to navigate us through so that we'll all live having gained a substantial understanding and reminder of what has been taught concerning praise and worship. <clears throat> I've been thinking about praise and worship, how important it is that praise and worship is the key to God's heart. So if ever you want to touch the heart of God, praise and worship is the route to take. If ever you want to move God, praise and worship is the route to take. Which means it is important, therefore, for us to have understanding of praise and worship. Let us look at Psalms chapter 6, the Psalm of David, in order to understand the importance of praise and worship. We are going to look at verse 5, but I would like us to start from verse 1. Psalm 6, verse 1. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Return, O oh Lord, deliver me. O, oh, save me for your mercy's sake. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? This, this is David crying unto the Lord <clears throat> for his mercies that the Lord may have mercy on him. And then now David coming to verse 5 he's touching the subject of praise. He says, if you Give up on me. If you surrender me to death, who is going to give you thanks? So this is David, who knows God, who has understood his ways and even which buttons to press if ever he wants to move him. He says, make sure that you do not allow me to die. Because if I die, who is going to give you thanks? For man was created for that purpose, to praise and worship God. So it is very important for us to understand that Praise and worship has its way to touch the heart of God. You look at Acts chapter 16. It speaks about Paul and Silas. After they have been beaten and put into the innermost prison, the word of God declares that in the midnight hour, they were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They were praying and singing hymns to God. But that led God because he says also, I believe in Psalms 22, verse 3, 
He says he inhabits or he, he, he is enthroned in the praises of Israel. So if ever you think that the throne of God or the throne that God prefers is the one that is in heaven, I believe you are mistaken. The throne that God prefers it is a throne that is praise and worship. Because God moved from heaven to be amongst sinners to, 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 to sit or be enthroned in the place where sinners are confined, that is the prison. And because of the presence of God and because God prefers his throne to be in the to be the praises and the worship. He did not mind that the other prisoners were benefiting even though they were sinners and some of them probably didn't even know God and some of them probably even cursed God but they benefited from the presence of God who enthroned himself among them. The word of God says the, 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 the prison doors flung open. The chains, they fell off. Not only from the saints, Paul and Silas, but even from the prisoners who didn't even open their mouth to praise and worship God. But because they were in the vicinity where the, pray, where the throne of God was activated, therefore they also benefited from the benefits that came with the presence of God and the throne of God among them. So all of these show and reveal to us the importance of praise and worship and that if ever we can understand and truly know how to praise and worship God, there is nothing that we cannot get. There is nothing that we cannot receive from, he, from Him. Be it a breakthrough, be it healing, be it even understanding. I can tell you, during the time of praise and worship, there is a lot of understanding that you receive. I'm sure you can attest to that. Even if it's a concept that you did not understand. Probably while you're just singing that song, that ungwele, ungwele. God just gives you another facet so that you understand another side of his holiness. So that's why I say Praise and worship is very important. And it is important for us to understand it. We have touched praise in our last session. Today we are going to touch worship. We are going to look at... Um, Genesis chapter 22. We are going to look and use the principle of first, the law of first mention in order to understand what worship is. And then after that, we are going to look at the greatest war that is waged against worship. So those are the two things that I would like to, 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 to touch on today. Amen. To define, that is, that is, that is to define worship using the law of first mention. What is that? The law of first mention 
states that any concept, any biblical concepts, any uh, 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 subject, any thing that you want to understand in the Bible, where it is first mentioned, that is where you are going to get enough information concerning that subject, concerning that doctrine, concerning that concept. So we are going to use that because in Genesis chapter 22, that is where the word worship is explicitly mentioned. Amen. Yes, the concept of worship may be mentioned in previous chapters. For example, in Genesis chapter 4, whereby the two sons of Adam, they brought to the Lord the sacrifices. So we are going to look at that. Maybe just to do a quick recap of what worship is, or rather of what praise is, which we touched last time. Can you give me a slide? What is praise? Charles Bach Bible Dictionary defines praise the following way. The word praise comes from the Latin term pretium, which means prize or value. It may also be defined as an ascription of value or worth. True praise consists in a sincere acknowledgement of a real conviction of worth. Amen. So you remember last time, if you recall, as you said, that, 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 that as, 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 as Charles defines it, Say the word praise means to prize or to value, yes. So, it's maybe defined as an ascription of value or worth. We said last time for you to be able to ascribe a value or worth to something, that means you need to have accurate knowledge of that thing that you ascribe a value to. That's why it is important for us to have the knowledge of God so that we can ascribe the proper praise to him. True praise consists in a sincere acknowledgement of a real conviction or worth. So now this thing is moving from outward to the inside. Because now it speaks of a real conviction. So this means you must be convicted in order to offer that proper praise. Let us look at Revelation chapter 4 whereby Apostle John is taken into heaven and sees all the things that are happening and transpiring in heaven. He sees the four living creatures. He sees the 24 elders. But our focus, I want us to focus at the 24 elders' reaction as to what they did for them to offer praise unto God. Let us see at 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. What are they doing here now? They are ascribing Praise unto God by saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive all glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your, and by your will they exist and were created. But 
Before that, what did they do? Verse 10, before they ascribe this praise to God, that you are worthy. What, a, what had happened? They fell down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And what did they do? They cast their crowns before the throne. Remember, these 24 elders, they are seated on their throne, but they removed their crowns and they cast them at the feet of the Lord. Now, what crowns are these that were on their head? There are two words that speak of crown. It's Stephanos as well as diadema. Diadema. Diadema speaks of a kingly crown. But Stephanos speaks of a victor's crown. Stephanos so a kingly crown you inherit, but a victor's crown you work for. So what they cast down at their feet was the victor's crown, saying that we value you so much, so much so that we are we see our crowns and our achievements as meaning nothing. You alone are worthy of glory. You alone are worthy of praise. So they cast their crowns at the feet of the Lord. So this gives us an idea us as the children of God, that the praise and the worship that we offer to God speaks of the understanding. It also speaks of the humility. Meaning, a person who's matured is able to give more praise unto God. Whatever that he or she has achieved, the more you grow into knowing God, the less the value of the things that you have, the value of the things that you have they continue to decrease until they become nothing. If you have a name in your community or at work or wherever, but as you grow in God, looking at how great our God is, all of these things, they so, diminish. They diminish. That you have known all those things you diminish. have achieved these, all these things diminish. You are a businessman and you have these cars and you have these houses there and there. All of these things they diminish. So as you grow, you consider <laughs> these things as, remember, all these are your victors, are the <laughs> things that you have attained, you have achieved. They are a crown on your head. They define you. But when you stand before the Lord, all those things become nothing. What does that tell us? Not everybody is able to touch the heart of God. Maybe that's why in our praise and worship, we have never seen the, the, the pillars of our, of our places of worship shaking. Because crowns are still on our heads. Even though we worship God, hey, I need to go out. We have a lunch with a friend. I have a business appointment that I need to attend to. That is praise and worship. You don't, you don't, you, 
We don't just get it in the shells. But all these things, they speak of growth. They speak of humility. Amen. Amen. So that's what we touched last time in defining praise. And we also, and we also said that praise is ascribed it's, it's either man ascribes praise to God or man ascribes praise to another man. God also ascribes praise to to men. And then creation ascribes praise to God. So that's what we said last time. But now Worship is a little bit different. Let us go to the slide of worship. We said it is homage paid to a superior, especially to God, usually expressed by prayer, sacrifice, and a ritual. As you would see in the Old Testament, Israel would come in the place that God had ordained, the place of worship, they would come with their offerings and then offer those sacrifices and do those prayers. So now, unlike praise, worship is given to a being. Greater. So whatever that you ascribe worship to, that which you ascribe worship to must be greater. Okay. So if you worship yourself, this means you deem yourself greater. That's why the word of God always encourages us that we need to humble ourselves or to consider others greater than ourselves. That's why if you look at the word of God and look at every man that God has ever used, not even a single one has not gone, had not gone through the process of being humbled. Because this is a very important step so that we will be able to worship God. This has touched me quite a great deal that even the Lord himself, for him to be able to serve, because we're going to see that even service unto God, it is worship on its own. So even the Lord Jesus Christ, for him to be able to serve the purpose and the plan of God, he had to go through these steps, as alluded in Philippians chapter 2. As it says, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be in, be, be in you also. Who being in very nature God, in essence he was God, but he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or as something to be used to his own advantage. But what did he do? He made himself of no reputation. It was not God the Father who made him of no reputation, but it was the Lord himself who made himself of no reputation. If you look at, at, at the meaning of the making with the making without reputation, the meaning behind it speaks of emptying. So, any minister of God needs to be emptied first before he can offer praise, before he can offer worship unto the Lord. So, the Lord had to go through these steps. He emptied himself. And then what? 
who being in the form of God did not consider its robbery to be equal with God, meaning he did not consider it as something to use to his own advantage. He did not count it as value. Unlike us, wherever we are, we want to be recognized. Last corner, see a fisher jokes bonagan. Hey, I'm a business person. So I deserve to sit in this place and in this place. Oh, I am a minister. Who's known all over the world. So whenever you introduce me, you must mention all my accolades, my secular accolades, as well as my accolades within the Christendom. That I have attained this doctrine in theology. That I have attained this. That I have these businesses. That I have these uh, debts. That I have so many this and this. I have a congregation of 50,000. All these are, your, are the accolades that wherever we stand, they should speak for us before God speaks through us. So whenever these things they speak for us, then the word of God bounces back from people. Or the word of God is misconstrued. Or the, the picture of God is mispainted as, if, as we know now. If I can put a picture of Jesus on the wall, two pictures, you it will not take you a minute to point who Jesus is. Why? Because that is a picture that has been portrayed in your mind. This is what we see nowadays. It is so painful that the church of God today, I think not even the church, it is so painful that the leaders in the church of God don't know whom they are representing. They don't have a clue. You see, by the way we speak, you see, by the way we present ourselves, we see, by the way, we relate or we speak about him. That we do not have a clue as to who Jesus is. Now, if I do not, have a, do not have a clue as to who Jesus is, how am I going to tell you who Jesus is? I will give you this shallow knowledge and this perverted knowledge of who God is. And you're going to run with this. That's why you see in the church of God that there is no power, but there is the world. In the church, the world is in the church, and the church is in the world. It's a mixed masala. It's a spaghetti. You don't know. You don't know whether... It's spaghetti. If you try to separate the spaghetti, it will break. So pork. You can't even taste it where it goes. So it, it, it's just a spaghetti. Okay. So it's, 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 very, it's very, 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 very painful to see that we do not know God. To see that we do not understand God. But we speak about him. We tell people about him. But in the church of God, there is no power, which is a clear sign that there is no God. In the church of God, you know, nowadays, 
In the past, you could tell a person who's going to church. And the person who's going to a mall. No but now, you can tell a person who's going to an interview. But you cannot tell a person who's going to a mall. Excuse me. You can tell a difference between a person who's going to an interview and the person who's going to a mall. But you cannot tell a difference between a person who's going to go to worship God and the person who's going to a mall. Why? Because we have told you that you can come as you are and remain as you are. We may not have said it with our words and our mouth, but our actions have debited that. It is so painful. But we trust the Lord that he is going to restore. As long as we hold on and cling to him, just like Daniel, who clung unto his God and his fellow brethren in Babylon, Everyone was doing his thing. But they clung unto God. They clung unto the fear of the Lord. They even prayed in Babylon. Do you pray in your workplace? Do you pray in your office when you come in? When you enter, when you enter those gates in your workplace, do you pray? How many people have you told about Jesus? Let's leave that alone. Do people see Jesus in you? Jesus can speak for himself. But he speaks through you. He sees the way that you and then people are going to say you are different. Let us continue. The four Greek terms, what is worship? The four Greek terms we mentioned last time is proskunio, to make obeisance, to reverence, to revere, stressing the, the feeling of awe or devotion. Prescuo, a religious worship, especially ceremonial uh, service of religion. And then Latruo, which is to serve, to render religious service. Which was done most of the times by Israel. Amen. Now we come to worship. As we said earlier, that we are going to look at what worship is. Now we have a concise understanding of what praise is. So we are going to look at worship. Briefly, in Genesis chapter 22, I want us to look or to read verse 1 to 18. Remember, this is where the word worship is first mentioned, as I alluded earlier. That it is first mentioned in this place. So we, we hope to get a substantial understanding of what worship is. So we are going to go through this passage of scripture. It's a, 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 a quite a lengthy scripture. Uh, I want you to bear with me. And then from here, we're going to extract eight points so that you can understand what worship is in, in many of its facets as it has as understood it. Can we read? Genesis chapter So here, this is Abraham who had a son, Isaac, he had another son. 
by the by Hagar. An Egyptian, an Egyptian woman who had the son by his own strength. But Isaac is the son of the promise. As God had promised him that he is going to give him a son. In Genesis chapter 15, he promised him that He's going to give him a son. Because when Abraham had um, came back from a war whereby they had captured, captured his son, his, his brother's son, his late brother's son, Lord. Lord. So when he came back, uh, the Lord said to him, Fear not, Abraham. Abraham. For I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And then Abraham asked, Abraham was uh, What shall you give me seeing I go childless? childless? And the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Eliezer Damascus. Damascus. And then the Lord promised him a son. And then he cut a covenant with him. So this is the son now. The, 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 the son had been born at this stage. And then God tested him. Because God has this tendency of blessing you and then testing you to so see if ever do you still believe in him. Are you still holding on unto him or are you, are you now relying on this on, on the blessing or on the breakthrough that he gave you. It is all for your benefit. Then God tested Abraham. Let's see that. Genesis chapter 22 from verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He went to the place of which God had told him. Continue. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, so he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. 
and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham. And he's been singing this song. Good if you didn't know this great kind of song. Continue. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nation of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Amen. Amen. So we see here, Abraham, we said we are going to look at this portion of scripture. Verse 5 explicitly, explicitly mentions that the act that Abraham did was the act of worship. Because it says, and Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So we are going to look at this portion from 1 to 18. Picking up a few points. There are about eight of them. I'm not saying there are eight. I'm saying as revealed to me, eight. At least for now. Amen. 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 So we look at verse 2. The, Abraham said, okay, or rather God said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. So with that, we understand that worship is pouring your all to God. Because to take your only if you have only, your only is equal to your all. Your only is equal to your all. So Abraham, as he took his only son, he took all that he had. Similar to what uh, 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 the, the woman Mary did. The brother of who? Lazarus. Or the sister. Sorry. The sister of Lazarus. Mary was, Martha was serving because the Lord was dining so Martha was serving and Mary took a, 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 a pound of spike nard or costly oil or costly perfume. He broke it. She broke it and did what? And anointed the Lord. And then they comes some of the disciples and said, why this waste? Because all of this could have been sold and given to the poor. Then the Lord responded to those who commented and said, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done this in preparation for my burial. And what this woman has done, it shall be recorded and be remembered. Okay, so this woman, Mary, he pour, she poured all her livelihood unto the Lord. She broke the alabaster box. Not necessarily, I believe, she did not, like, 
break the alabaster box, but the seal. She broke the seal of the alabaster box and then anointed the, 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 the Lord in preparation for his burial. Now, the word of God also tells us that as she broke the alabaster box, the perfume spilled the entire room. Now, the breaking of the alabaster box is according to this scripture. It spoke it spoke of the preparation for his burial. But now there is a need for the breaking of our will. Not for the preparation of the Lord's burial, because the Lord has been, has been buried. But for the preparation of his coming. Now, there is a global revival that is about to come. But it awaits for the internal revival. The internal revival it will not kick off up until the seal is broken. The seal is our will. We are the alabaster box. But the seal is our will. Which contains the alabaster box contained costly oil. But that costly oil could not fill the room up until Mary broke the seal. So there was, even the costly oil was in the room, but as long as the seal had not yet been broken on the, on the alabaster box, the perfume could not fill the entire room. But there is a perfume, a very costly perfume, that could sustain a person for a year. But all that was useless up until the seal was broken. And only then it could be used to anoint the Lord and prepare for his burial and also the perfume to fill the entire room. So we are also an alabaster box. We are not containing the expensive ointment. We are not containing expensive oil. But we are containing the fragrance of the knowledge of God. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 say? Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. We, for we are to God the fragments of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one Go we, back. We are, 15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Verse 16. To those to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Let me see verse 14. Yes, this is the verse that I was looking for. Now thanks be to God 
who God. always leads us into triumph in Christ. And through us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So God, through us, diffuses what? The fragrance of his knowledge. So God fills us with the knowledge of Christ. But this knowledge of Christ is hindered by our will for it to diffuse into the outward world. If the seal of our will is not broken, we are going to be a alabaster box that contains expensive knowledge of God. But all that knowledge of God that is very expensive it is going to be useless up until the seal of the will is broken. Now there's one thing that God cannot tamper with. That is your will. The only thing that you can do is to fill the alabaster box with his knowledge. knowledge. But it is up to the individual to break the seal, to break the will, so that the knowledge of Christ may diffuse into the world. Just like the fragrance of Mary filled the entire room. There is a place for the breaking of the will. But the journey to that place is up to an individual. That place is Getsemane. Getsemane is a place of trading. It's a place where you trade the will of God for your will. It's a place of trading. We are going to trade. I want, I want someone to trade. It's a place of trading. Trading the will of God. This is your will. This is the will of God. So, Getsemane is a place of trading. Some of us, we know that we have to go to Getsemane. But because Getsemane it's not a pleasant place. Because Ketemane is a place of pain. Because Ketemane is a place whereby we are going to be removed of your dignity. Removed of your honor. It's a place of shame. Now, because of that, some of us come this close. When you come to the altar call, you come this close to the Lord and say, Father, I want to trade my will for your will. But when church ends, next year, or next week, or you say, it's very hard. But you need to come to, because God cannot temper with your will. You need to change. You give God, you give God your will. You give God your will. God gives you His will. Did you see? Your will is still here. But it's inside it the will of God. It cannot rise. It, it can never be seen. In essence, he cannot take it. But you are subjecting it under the will of God. What does Pastor Shangas have now? Under the will, and inside 
His will is subjected within the peripherals. At times when someone provokes him, he is tempted to use his will. But because of the word, his will goes back to its place. He is tempted to respond because he he also has an ability to respond or to face any temptation. But because he has subjected his will inside the will of God, he submits. So there is a place called Gethsemane. That place is a place of subjection of the will. Where we subject our will to the will of God. Let's look at Jesus, what he said. 2639, Matthew and 42. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Nevertheless, go back. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42. Verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. He was subjecting his will under the will of God. So, there is you, there is your destiny. The journey between you and your destiny, there is Ketemane. Ketemane is inevitable. God cannot take you to Ketemane. You need to take yourself to Ketemane. Because your will, God has promise that he's not going to tamper with it. So you will never reach your destiny as long as you escape, as long as you shy away and turn a blind eye to Ketemane because you are fearing pain. So between, your, between you and your destiny lies within Ketemane. You need to make a decision. You need to prepare your mind. You need to go to the place where your will is going to be broken. And that place is Ketemane. Let us continue pouring your all, looking at worship. The second point, worship is an expression of love. What did God say to Abraham? Whom you love, your son. Verse 2, he said, your son, Abraham, Isaac, whom you love. Okay. So worship is an expression of what? It is an expression of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his love. So if you love God, then you give him what you love the most. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the dear son of the Father. So he gave him because he was expressing his love to us. So worship is an expression of love. So when God said to Abraham, 
Give me your only son whom you love. So there we get an understanding of what worship includes. So worship is an as Abraham gave that which he loved, he was expressing his love to God. What does God say? If you love me, you ought to keep my commandments. So this is how we express love to God. By keeping his commandments. In John chapter 14 verse 21, what does he say? There's a because of time. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. He who has my commandments and keeps them, give me the best life, is the one who loves me. Next slide. And he who loves me, Lord I will disclose myself to him. Now, the problem is, many of us get stuck in the possession stage. And in the possession stage, as in, in the stage of possessing his commandments, in the state of knowing his commandments, having a knowledge of his commandments. But when it comes to keeping his commandments, it becomes extremely difficult. By the way, it's not going to become easy. So you just have to plant yourself there. It's not easy to keep the commandments of God. If anyone has told you that it's easy, he's not speaking about God. The God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who created other gods. He's not speaking about that one. So to keep the commandments of God is not easy, but it's not burdensome. It's not easy, but it's not bad in some. There's a difference between the two. Because it's not bad in some because you are prepared by love. It was not easy for the Lord to give himself for us. But because of the love that he had for us, it was not bad in some. So maybe the problem is we don't love God that much. That's why we are failing to keep his commandments. Yes, we have his commandment, the hairs in this verse, but we don't keep his commandments. But now the equation stands. The, the equation says, if you keep my commandments, anyone who has my commandments and keeps them, I will disclose myself. So maybe that's the reason why the Lord does not disclose himself in the churches. Because the saints and the people and the members of the body of Christ, they have a vast knowledge of the, well, of, the, of, of the commandments of God. But the works of God they don't have. Faith without works is dead. These are the things that you don't have. So now the equation is not balanced. Because what you have... You, you have the commandments, but you do not have the works. Therefore, disclosure, therefore, the revelation of God to you cannot be seen. So you do not need to claim that you know God. You don't need to claim that God knows you, but it shall be seen. That means you don't, need, you don't need to speak. You don't need to say anything. You don't need to even to quote any scripture. But it's going to be seen that the seal of your will has been broken. Because as you stand, as that alabaster, Oh, stand in any place where there are people. Diffusion. 
from Uk low concentration to, lisa. from high concentration to low concentration. That's how the molecules of anything that diffuses in the molecules are normal. It moves from low concentration to so high concentration to low concentration. So wherever you are, the knowledge of God is going to diffuse. And people will not be able to speak anyhow. If you are a saint and people feel comfortable to speak to you about anything, there's a problem. If people are comfortable to speak about their boyfriends and their girlfriends to you, then you have a problem. There was a guy when we were still in school. He was a very cool guy. I went to the He was saved. But Unati. Kota Unati is his name. All right. I didn't mean to mention his name because he is no longer with us. So, so yeah, but the case is. Kota Eben Gushuguti. When you know more than when you meet with him, you feel like running away. <laughs> you will tell you. But but you'll you just be, you know, uncomfortable. But he wouldn't say anything. Come to him, say. No. He would invite you. He'd come and say, hey, you know, this girl come, that I come, saw. Come. I was, I was, I was. Yeah. So. If, 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 if you are a believer, a true believer whose seal has been broken, the will that is, then wherever you are, as the fragrance of Christ diffuses, it binds the evil. It binds the evil where you are. It makes evil not be comfortable to express itself as it would in your absence. So, if ever, this is probably another measure or another test, a litmus test to test whether your seal has been broken. So if people they are comfortable to speak to you about things that they should not be speaking about, unholy things, there is a problem with you. There is a problem with the seal. Or maybe it's just, just been broken but a little bit. You don't need to open it. Just break it. You break it once. You break it once. You break it once. You break it once. You You don't open it like the aquil bottle that you are going to close again. You open it once. You break it once. Even if you try to close it, you won't be able to. You are going to be called a pastor or a pastor's wife. Even if you are not. I remember, <laughs> I remember one, one saint. I heard the story. He comes to school. Uh, he has a lot of This saint. He has a lot of time. 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 Coming to school, uh, and they want to greet to... and goes to the front. I can't remember whether she said the most or amen, but she said something in those lines. <laughs> so I heard from her that she said they call her Oma Mumfundis. So the fragrance of Christ. Yeah, it if you take the pasta boxes, it and place it there. I think any energy, I think any pump, I think anything. It works by the law of diffusion. If there is high concentration, it's going to diffuse to the low concentration. Let us move. I promise you, you're not going to see me anytime soon. <laughs> I want, 
I want to make sure that <laughs> I don't come back here in the next uh, four to five weeks. So I need to make sure that I finish today. Amen. Amen. Next point. God appoints a place of worship. Go to the land of Moria. So there is a place God has anointed and ordained. A place of worship. You cannot just worship God anywhere. But there is a place that God has ordained. Just like he commanded Abraham. He did not say, go offer your son. Your only son Isaac. But he says, take him and go to the land of Moria and offer him there. In the Old Testament, there was a place that God had ordained for his worship. We see in David, when David had sinned and counted his army, God was not happy with that and he gave him three verdicts to choose from. David, being a man who knows God and knows the battle to press and knows the attributes and the character of God, he said it is better to fall in the hands of God than because his mercies are very great. So, cutting the long story short, after 70 people were killed, 70,000 people were killed, God was grieved and he repented and told up David to build an altar there. And then David built an altar. And then from that place he received a revelation that there. The temple of the Lord is going to be built in that place. So there is a place where God appoints as a place of worship. So that same idea was translated even to the New Testament. Even in the New Testament, God has appointed a place of worship. That place of worship is spirit and truth. Spirit and truth, it is a place. Why do I say so? Because if you look at the narrative in John chapter 4, when the Lord speaks with the woman of Samaria. There comes a point when the woman of Samaria says to the Lord, you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. But we Samaritans believe that the place of worship is this place, the Mount of Gerizim. And then the Lord responded and said, yes, 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 Woman, okay, let's start in verse 20. Our fathers worship in this mountain, referring to the mountain of Gerizim. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. So they are speaking or they are discussing the place of worship. I want you to have that in mind. And then Jesus responded and said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship in this mountain. So this is the place where the Samaritans were worshiping. Neither, nor in Jerusalem, the place where the Jews worship. But he says, the hour is coming. And now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Not in Jerusalem, not in, 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 in Gerizim or in Jerusalem. But now, the place of worship where I have ordained is in spirit and in truth. John chapter 17. John 17. 17. 
Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So there is a place of worship. And that place is the place of truth. So for you to be able to worship God, you must stand in the way. Because the truth is the way. And you cannot worship God with your soul. But many of them worship with the soul. Forgive me. Because many of them are not standing in the truth. How then will they worship in spirit? Because the place of truth is the place of, of spirit. Because God is spirit. So God being spirit cannot be worshipped with the soul or with the mind. How is it that the non-believers, they sing and dance to the gospel songs. If the gospel songs proceed from the spirit of the person who's standing in the truth, how is that the world is accepting the truth? And then they play the songs in their Places of party. They play gospel songs. If the person that is singing and worshiping God worships in truth, it should be that the people should not listen, the people in the world, they should not listen to the song because the songs are convicting them. Because the songs are revealing their sin. They should not be listening to them. Or else, they should be convicted and fall into repent and, and then repent. But do they repent? No, they don't repent. Why? Because the worshippers are not standing in the truth. But they are standing in a lie and professing the truth. Now, this means worship does not Come from the talent, but worship comes from the character. Whatever that you release, you are releasing your character. And the word of God said, it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. So whatever that you are releasing, you are no longer releasing anything other than the fragrance of Christ. So if the Lord was not accepted in 2,000 years ago, how is it that you speak about the Lord and he is readily accepted by everyone? That a person can sing a gospel song while carrying a bottle of alcohol and not be convicted and dance in the way that the world dances. How is it that the world is able to tell the gospel songs and make them the house songs? How is it that the world is able to tell the gospel songs and make them the R&B songs? That means the others of those songs had never stood in this place that God has ordained. There is a place of worship that God has ordained. And that place is truth and spirit. That place is spirit and truth. There is no other place that God has ordained other than this one. Whatever that you do, you are worshiping in the soul. And the God is not soul. But God is a spirit. Amen. He chooses the object of worship. You cannot give God anything that you think he wants. But he is the one who chooses the object of worship. He said to Abraham, take now your son, Isaac, he had two sons, 
as well as Isaac. But God was clear that among your sons, I want Isaac, whom you love, go and offer him. So God is the one who chooses the objects of worship. So we can give what we think God wants. But we must give what God has revealed that he wants. So, everything that God wants is in the Holy Scriptures. He says, God, God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that is the worship that one needs to offer to God. The service. An object of worship. God is the one who chooses it. You remember the story of Cain and Abel. Cain offered what he thought God wanted. And Abel offered what he knows what God wants. Both of them, I believe, they knew what God wanted. But the other one chose to give what he wanted. Not what God wanted. That's why God said, if you do good, we will not be accepted. Number five, both the offerer and the offering offer praise to God. I and the Lord will go yonder and worship and are going to come back. I, Abraham, the offerer, and the Lord, the offering, we are going to go yonder and worship and then we are going to come back. Many of us pay more attention to the offering and less attention if any at all to the so if God, if um, both um, the um, offerer um, and um, the offering, um, they both offer worship to God, um, that means there is a state um, that the offering also needs to be in. Um, and more importantly, there is a state where the offerer needs to be in. So both the offering and the offerer needs to be in a particular state. Because when God gave instruction to Israel about the type of offering that they need to bring to him, he explicitly mentions that it should not be without blemish. So that's the offering. But also God wants the offerer to be in a certain state because both of these two, they worship God. What is the state that the offerer needs to be in? This is a decreased state. Why do I say so? It is because if you remember earlier what we said, we said that worship is slightly different to praise. Praise can be between two persons, meaning persons of, of equal, or it can be from God to men, meaning from one is greater to the one who is lesser, or from Man to God. There is one lesser to the one greater. But praise is, or rather worship, is not like that. Worship is from the one lesser to the one greater. So whatever that you worship, you esteem it. It means you look at it as something that is great. So if that's the case, that means there, is, there, there needs to be some work that needs to be done to the person that is offering so that he can be less and be in the position of offering worship. Because worship travels 
from lower to higher. So if you see yourself as equal with God, then you will not be able to worship God. One may say, I don't see myself as equal with God. That means then I worship God. But now look at it this way. Whatever service you offer to God, all of that service is worship to God. Now, what, how do you offer service to God? By serving men, you offer service to God. So as you serve men, men is your equal. So for you to serve God through men, and men is your equal, then there is a state that you need to be in. This is a decreased state. Because worship will not go to God unless you decrease. So you need to humble yourself so that you'll be able to worship God. That's why, as we said earlier, what was happening with these days is he also had to humble himself. The Lord because he, is, told, he took the form of a man. But now, to be able to worship God, God and for God to say, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, the Lord had to come to that point of decreasing and being humble. As to, as to in the form of a servant. Number one, Considering himself, even though I am God, even though I am a manager, even though I am a director, I don't pick up paper. I don't clean the offices. But in the house of God, I do that. Because this is my act of worship. But no, not just anybody does that. But only a person who has been decreed and been humbled. So we see the Lord humbling himself. So we as the children of God, I see Moses the word of God declares that there is no person that is more humble than him. But there is the Lord. We need to ask the Lord to teach us the arts of humility. Because humility is a skill. It's an art. So, the Lord is the one who perfected this skill. Who perfected this art of humility. So we need to ask the Lord as the disciples of the Lord and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. We need to ask the Lord and said, Lord, teach me the art and the skill of humility. And then the Lord is going to take you through the process. The same process. He considered it himself as equality with God. Not as something to be grasped. So, those are the steps. So, don't look at yourself. Remove your stiffness. Your crown. As the, the 24 elders remove them. And place them at the feet. After the Lord had not considered as, as himself as somebody, but I'm trying to, 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 to convey this point. What did he do? After that, he emptied himself. And then after emptying himself, what did he do? Then he humbled himself. That's when humbling came. And then in humility comes obedience. Because up until you have re reduced yourself, only then will, be, will you be obedient to God. Because God is going to send you to someone who is your equal or someone who is not of your caliber, according to worldly status, probably someone of lower 
Caliber, then you. So if you are not in a reduced state, then you will not be able to serve God. Consider Moses. Moses was highly esteemed in Egypt. He was learned in all the wisdom and the knowledge of the Egyptians. Moses was, was to become the next prince or the next king of Egypt. Moses was eloquent, a well-spoken person. But after the process of condescending, the process of reduction, Moses comes to the point and says, I cannot speak. How is it that Moses now cannot speak? Isn't the same Moses that Stephen tells us that he was eloquent? Why? Because God has passed him through the process of reduction, reducing the offering. And the offerer, both offer praise to God. Our focus is mainly on the offering, but less on the offerer. But God's focus is mainly on the offerer, and less on the offering. Not saying that God does not look at the offering, but God a person who has been worked by God. I find it difficult to see him or her not offering the proper worship to God. I find it impossible. So once the offerer comes into a perfect state that God wants, Genesis 4 7. If you do well, Will it not be accepted? What God is saying? He's speaking to who? To Abel. To Cain, rather. No, Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? But in previous verses, what God, what God said, he said, but God, I believe it's verse 5, but God did not respect Cain and his offering. Yes. God did not respect Cain and his offering. And then in verse 7, when God is counseling Cain, what is he saying? If you do well, will you not be accepted? So the focus now is on the offerer. Amen. Amen. So it is very important for us to look at things as the way that God looks at them. Because everything that you offer to God, many of the things you offer to God as worship, all of those things are standing in the soul, not in the actual place of worship, which is the spirit and the soul. First Peter chapter two verse five: You are also a you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Not just a priesthood, but a holy priesthood. So God is concerned. He's not concerned about producing a priesthood, but he wants to produce a holy priesthood. Some, an adjective that is not seen nowadays in the Christendom. We see a priesthood. Oh, we are a priesthood. We are God's priesthood. But not a holy priesthood. God is making and creating a holy priesthood. Only a holy priesthood is acceptable to God. Worship is personal. Stay here, I and the Lord will go yonder and worship and come back. We may all go to the place of worship. Cooperatively. But worship is personal. 
Each and every one of us needs to offer worship to God. Meaning, each and every one of us who desire to offer worship to God must go to Getsemane. We have heard that the Lord has gone to Getsemane. And through the work of redemption, we have received salvation. But him going to Getsemane was for our salvation. We also need to go to Getsemane in order for us to fulfill the purpose that God has ordained for us. So worship is personal. Worship is the fear of God. It is an expression of the fear of God. For now I know that you fear God. Why? Because you have not withheld your son from me. So, withholding, not, withholding from God is depriving God the worship. What has God asked of you? Was it a too high price to pay? Is it higher than the price that he himself paid in giving his son for us? Is it the higher price that Abraham paid in giving his son to God. What is it that God has asked of you? And what have you withheld from him? Did you know that withholding, that thing is withholding worship to God? Worship finally is obedience. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Finally, you are now able to obey. So, worship is obedient. So, as you obey God, you are expressing worship to him. Because of time, we would have gone through the battle that has been waged against worship. Because there is a battle that the enemy is waging against worship. And that battle, it is found in Timothy. Timothy. I'm rushing against time now. Because I'm going to put to my card. Chapter 3, verse um, 1 to 5. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. No, we're not going to read. Because of time. I'm closing now. But there is a, there is a, 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 a war. That has been waged against worship. And that war has been waged, as, 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 as Second Timothy mentions. He mentioned that in the last days, in the perilous times, times are going to come where men are going to be lovers of themselves, et cetera, et cetera, lovers of money, boasters, and, money, and so forth. All of that, the first one being mentioned, is being a lover of self, self-love. The self-love wages war against God-love. Loving God. And loving God, it is worship. Because when God spoke, or rather when the When they asked him, what is the greatest command? He responded and said, you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. So the first is to love God. And then the second it is to love your neighbor as yourself. So, and then the person was asking the Lord, he said to him, you have spoken well. Because to love him and as it, it is in to love God with all your heart, with all the understanding and with all the soul, with all strength is to love and to love one's neighbor is more than all the whole Burnt offering and sacrifices, Mark chapter 12, verse 33. So, what does it tell us? When it says more, so to love is, you remember that in the Old Testament, offerings and sacrifices were offered to God as a form of worship. So, when it says to love God more, to love God is more than offering and sacrifices. So it means to love God is worship. So to love self is self-worship. And to love God is God worship. So the war that has been waged in these last days, this is the war of the extreme change of the objects of worship. Meaning that instead, Satan did not remove love in the, in the church, but he just exchanged the objects. Instead of loving God, we love ourselves. So by so doing, we are exchanging the worship. Instead of giving worship to God, we are giving worship to ourselves. So this is the war that has been waged in the house of the Lord. There is so much self-worship and less God-worship. This is through the seed of self-love. Anything that you do that shows self-love is self-worship. And this is the spirit that has been released of self-worship. In this lesson. So the Holy Spirit is alerting us and warning us to guard against this spirit because they are going to be prevalent in these last days. That if you turn to the left, you're going to find it. To the right, you're going to be tempted on every side to worship self. Oh, I'm tired today, I cannot do this. Oh, pastor, I can't come to the online prayer, I cannot choose another person. All of that is self-love. All of that is self-worship. This is a war that has been waged against worship. The Holy Spirit forewarned us many centuries ago. In fact, in the first century. But yet we fall prey to this spirit. Why do we not believe the word of God? Or we don't want to do the word of God? Which is which? As we close, I want us to pray.